pre-recorded. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Ariane Burgess. I'm the convener of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee and I would like to welcome you to the 2024 Festival of Politics and this year celebrates the festival's 20th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life in five days of spirited debate. And I, I imagine some of you have already been engaging in other sessions. And I look forward to this discussion and hearing people's thoughts and views. It's important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute even where there may be differences of opinion and that we, are always, we, we always treat each other respectfully, which is something that MSPs do very well in, um, in committee rooms especially. Um, we're delighted um, that you can join us today to participate in what is local government for and it's fantastic to see so many people that are interested in this topic and this is in partnership with COSLA and later I'll be inviting you to get involved with your questions and comments so we have a bit of time after I've uh, already grilled the panelists. Um, if you're keen to throw your thoughts out there you can do so using at visit Scott Parle on Instagram and uh, I would also like to welcome our two BSL uh, uh, interpreters, Megan Fricklejohn and Jenny Laird, who are working with us today. So thank you so much for uh, helping us out there. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Councillor Professor Stephen Heddle and Adam Lang here in the room. And online we're joined by Professor Donna Hall, CBE, and Dr. Jonathan Carwest. Uh, Councillor Heddle is the Vice President of the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, otherwise known as COSLA. <coughs> and I've got my speaking notes in order here. Uh, and is a visiting professor at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Professor Donna Hall is Chair of Possibilities, a social enterprise that supports vulnerable people uh, um, living the life they want to live. And she was the CEO of Wigan Council for eight years and was awarded a CBE in, 20, uh, in 2009 for innovation and public service. And she is now the chair of the innovative national think tank, the New Local Government Network. Adam Lang is a director at the Carnegie UK Trust, responsible for shaping the organization's work to promote and improve the well-being of people across the UK and Ireland. His previous role included Head of Nesta Scotland and Head of Policy and Communications at Shelter Scotland. And Dr. Jonathan Carr West has been Chief Executive at the Local Government Information Unit since uh, 2013 and is a leading national expert on local government transformation, local democracy, and public services. And I have to say that I, uh, through my time as convener on the committee, We've had uh, really great uh, evidence uh, giving from, I think, pretty much ev everyone. I think, have you come to committee yet? I have not. You have come not to had the not, grilling not had committee that invitation yet. As of yet. <laughs> well, right. Well, let's see how you do today. We might get you along. I might not get the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> this is your interview. <laughs> um, so there will be, as I said, there'll be an opportunity for um, you to put your questions uh, and views to the panel. Um, however, I'm going to start with a number of questions, and I think I'll, I'll start with the kind of overarching question that um, will set the scene. Um, and uh, I just uh, maybe I'll start with Councillor Hale. Throw it to you, so you know it's coming your direction. And that is, what do you believe are the core purposes of local government? Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Ariane. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's get root to the root of the, the the subject of this this session, obviously. Uh, and, you know, coming from the perspective of COSLA, it would be very easy just to concentrate solely on all the services that the local government provides. With local government, obviously, it's very much a, a, the part of the public sector that uh, touches uh, the biggest part of people's lives, literally from the, the, the cradle to the, to the grave. And I, I was reflecting on this yesterday when I was at the, only the, the second of our cremation of attended in Fife. And it was courtesy of Fife Council Bereavement Services. And I thought, yeah, really, yes, very much from the, the, the cradle to the grave. But I mean, it's obviously the, when we're talking about the services, it's the things that everybody's familiar with, uh, like education, 
uh, social care, roads, uh, <coughs> economic development, uh, waste, uh, recycling. I mean, it's uh, just about everything that uh, you have to deal with on a, a, a daily basis. But I think it's important to not just to focus on the services because uh, I, I don't think any uh, councillor, any elected member would have joined their local authority thinking, well, I'm really looking forward to promoting best value and ensuring a, a minimum set of standards to keep the, the, the accounts commission happy. I mean, if you're a council leader, you think that a lot, but the, your average uh, elected member more motivated by the, the people side of things, and it's kind of melding the question more into who is local government for. And the local government is for the people in the, the council area. Uh, and the, the local part of this is obviously very important because the, the, the council area is going to be an area that has a sense of identity, uh, is easily de defined and, and uh, comprehensible, maybe less so in the case of Highland Council, which is uh, enormous. But it means that the, the people in the area have a, a connection to the the services that's been delivered to the decisions that's being made in their area, uh, and they have somebody that they can go to. Uh, for me, as a, a councillor, the thing that motivates me in local government is being able to address the, the kind of power imbalances that people might experience, uh, both in terms of dealing with the council as the corporate body, because, I mean, we, we have to view the council as two things. There's the corporate body and there's the elected members. So it's the, the elected members maybe have to take on the corporate body on behalf of their constituents on some occasions, but they may have to take on the government, they may have to take on agencies uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I, th I think this is all part of the, the important checks and balances in our political system in this country. And it's, uh, it's very important that it, it exists to allow uh, the, the whole system to function well. Thank, thanks very much for that response. I think there were some interesting things it, that I just wanted to pick up. One, you kind of pulled this idea through, like, who is local government for? Uh, and this bit around addressing the, the, the power imbalances. And I have heard uh, sometimes comments from people where they say, oh, it's an official-run uh, council rather than, a, rather than that. Uh, the elected members being able to cut through. Um, but I think another piece that is interesting in Scotland is you mentioned Highland Council, that um, you, you're, you're in um, Orkney Island Council. Uh, Highland Council, as you say, is very big. And what I have a, have a sense of from my work in the committee is that we have 32 very different local authorities, not in just how they're run, but in the size and that kind of proximity to representation and kind of closest to, to, to the power. I'm going to bring in, just to see if anyone online, and we didn't kind of really discuss how we're going to work this, so maybe you just indicate if you want to come in on a question. Um, and, uh, uh, but I just want to see if Donna or Jonathan, you want to come in on, on that and add anything more. Donna, I see you nodding, so I'll bring you yeah. in. Yeah, come on in. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Ariane. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, yep. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the, the purposes of local government have changed a lot um, over recent years. I think certainly when I started uh, at Salford City Council a long time ago, it was very much about providing services, you know, really providing excellent services. Uh, but I think now we realise that local government's got much more of a role around place shaping, making the place a better creating the conditions for people to flourish, for communities to flourish, and having a different relationship with citizens than we traditionally used to have. It used to be very transactional. Basically, people would be, would be grateful for what they were given, um, and the council would decide what they were given with very little or no consultation. Um, what I've tried to do in my kind of career in local government, um, most recently in Wigan, was to try to shape a different relationship with citizens, the Wigan deal was about uh, brokering a new social contract with citizens where we tried to get through the funding cuts together. So we were able to freeze council tax uh, to make radical changes to the way we delivered services and to invest in community assets uh, in partnership with the NHS and other partners like the police, departments of work and pensions, housing. And I think that's that kind of radical place shaping, different 
role for local government is definitely coming to the fore now. Great. Thank you very much for that. I think that's, that's, that's um, it, it's really heartening to actually hear that evolution, that it's really about, I love that what you say about really helping people to flourish and with this kind of new social contract, this kind of idea. Adam. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to come in, in the back of, of those remarks from um, Professor Hall, because I, I, I really agree with them. Um, so I, I work for Carnegie UK, which is a, a, a UK-wide charitable foundation. And we've been working for over 110 years in the UK to, uh, well, the aim is to try and improve the well-being of people across all parts of the UK and Ireland. Um, and one of the ways in which we interpret that that I think is really relevant to today is we, we think there are really important components that need to be in place for public policy and public services to meaningfully improve people's lives. And one of those is the, is the concept of subsidiarity, which is a, a kind of geeky policy term for the idea that the central state should really only do the things that can be done best by a central state and everything else should be done as locally as possible. Because the idea is that a more local level of decision making, a more local level of service provision can respond better to the needs of people in that place or places. And I think that's something for me, so I'm not a councillor of course, I don't work for a local authority, but in terms of the principle of why local government matters and why it's crucial in the, the, the sort of makeup of the United Kingdom, for, for me and for Carnegie UK is that point of subsidiarity, being able to respond to local needs in a way that is proportionate, in a way that is tailored to those needs. And that's something that at multiple levels of, of centralisation starts to fall down. And so that's, that's why I think local government, however it's constructed, however it's constituted, however it's resourced, however it's, you know, whatever the politics around it are, the principle of local government as a means to providing better public policy and public services for individuals in places is a really, really important one. And I, and I think one of the things I, I notice again around um, why we kind of need to move in that direction in Scotland, I think we're on that, we're, we're, we're heading in that direction, I hope, uh, is actually geography. So going to, or I, I'm, I represent the Highlands and Islands regions. It's the best region, don't tell anyone else. <laughs> Most beautiful. Uh, and I go to Shetland and Orkney, Western Isles, Highland, Murray and Argyll. And the challenges for those councils are very different. And, and I think actually one of the reasons that uh, having actually the Scottish Parliament and then local government makes sense to me is that You've got 650 MPs in Westminster. Most of them don't have to deal with islands and the difficulties and challenges that you have to think through if you've got communities living on islands. So that's you know really like getting to the most local level. You start to understand those challenges uh, just uh, that face uh, that a community faces because of the geography that they live in. And uh, you know one of the big challenges of how do we maintain population in place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the subsidiarity point is, is very, very important. And as you say, this is something that we hopefully are working towards. <clears throat> I mean, we, we're attempting to enshrine this through the, the Verity House Agreement, uh, which uh, basically uh, adopts parts of the European Charter of Local Self-Government, which is the, you know, the local by default, national by agreement, national by uh, uh, evidence, to show that this is actually going to be better. <clears throat> and the European Charter of self, uh, Local Self-Government, I mean, the, the fact that it exists just shows that this uh, principle is uh, recognised in so many other, other countries, uh, yet to be recognised in law in the, the UK and Scotland, but hopefully Scotland can be the, the, the cheerleader uh, for that, or the, the, the demonstration for that. Uh, the just before you move on and make mm -hmm. your next point, sorry to interrupt, but maybe unpack a little bit, because maybe not everybody knows what the Verity House Agreement is. That's common language for us, but maybe just so that people can track the conversation. Yes, yeah, so the, the Verity House Agreement is uh, an agreement between local government and the, the Scottish government, which uh, discusses uh, a better way of working. It's, uh, it's a non-legally binding agreement, discusses a better way of working between the two governments that respects the, 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 the various jurisdictions, but also uh, realises that the, the, the government has concerns about accountability, uh, so has accountability wrapped into that and looks to set up a sustainable financial framework between the, the, the two spheres of government. So uh, to allow us to, to plan 
uh, in longer term and you know just uh, end up with better services which is everything that we're, we're about uh, <coughs> coming back to the the, the subsidi that subsidiarity point uh, I think when we discuss subsidiarity too uh, coming for the the layer of local government we have to to recognize that uh, while we contend that uh, power shouldn't automatically uh, reside in Holyrood or end up in Holyrood uh, through centralization or stop at Holyrood if they're devolved from the UK government that uh, perhaps the, the, the well not perhaps exactly the same principle applies to us in, in the councils as well and we need to be enabling subsidiarity within our own areas uh, so we have community councils but we have other uh, bodies such as development trusts uh, and you know in in the situation where I come from where we have 20 inhabited islands we have uh, organically uh, smaller units that uh, or geography that have a, a right to come together and uh, kind of petition us so you know it's a, it's a principle that we have to, to observe and I think uh, James uh, Mitchell writing in the, the, the left review points out that you know this isn't really happening in Scotland uh, when James has made the point, I think in every every possible opportunity about the centralisation that uh, has pertained in this country uh, since uh, devolution, not not restricted to, to any government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. But Orkney, uh, one of the things I love about Orkney Island Council is that because because our committee did a, a it's the fiftieth anniversary of community councils in Scotland and well, actually in the UK, and uh, we did a piece of work on that um, earlier in the year. Uh, celebrating them, but also kind of digging into, like, you know, the level of power and say that they have. And what came to light is that actually they have very little financial ability, which is what gave rise to the development trusts in many cases. But in Orkney, you actually do give the community councils quite a bit of, not a lot, but something more to work with. So yeah. there's there's things that can happen at a local yeah, level. Yeah. So where community councils actually have the the means to to, to do things in their areas. I mean, we, it, as you say, it's not a lot of money. It's uh, maybe about eight to ten thousand pounds per community council, uh, but we also give them an administrative capacity in the form of a, a paid clerk, which means that they have the, the ability to go after other funds, and anything that they fund, uh, we will match fund to a, a, an equivalent amount. So, which is so that's that's certainly empowering, and other community councils. You're, you're talking in the thousands, but in other community councils, it's more like in the hundreds that they yeah. have to... And, to the, I mean, the, the, the quid pro quo is, I think, it's better for a democracy because we find that the community councils, because they can do things, uh, it means that the people are more liable to want to stand for the community council because they can achieve something. Yeah, certainly. Uh, OK, I, I want to bring Jonathan in. Yeah, come on in. Technology is going to... Oh, all right, here we go. Um, no. Look, I agree with that. Um, um, but keep speaking, and uh, we'll see if we can get your volume turned up. OK, I'll lean in a bit as well. So, look, I don't disagree with anything, but I think it, it's important to be clear about... You know, so there are two stories you in the history of local government, and one is, as on the tin, government that is local, it, democratic institution okay. that gives Jonathan you're cutting in and out and I think I have a hunch that possibly your hand gesture is somehow so okay. if you can just be I a bit stiller like my, my, sorry to do I know I, I like to speak with my hands do, as well <laughs> try do again my very best. Is that, is that without movement keep going and let's see saying, how we go what I was saying you know there's two histories of local government one is about local government you know, democratic institution, the operation of local people, and local government as a bureaucracy that delivers services. Now, you can bring the, you know, Donna talked about the work she did in Wigan. What was powerful about that was it local people in a democratic contributing to, to shaping the, but those two local government, the democratic one and the can also go in the other direction. It's also important to say that we have, you know, apart from the position of being one of the most in the world, talked about subsidiarity, 
you know, intrinsic law build subsidiarity and work into their constitution with mates. Okay, the Verity House is a good state. Okay, I'm going to have to come in that. because you're... We can kind of get most of what you're saying, but there's quite a lot of work of kind of filling in the gaps, isn't there? Okay. I think we, it's a bit, a bit hard. Good. I wonder if you turn off your video and we try that um, and then just see if uh, broadcasting, do you think that that might help if he turns his video off? Yeah. So if you turn off your video, that would be good. And maybe in the meantime, we go to someone else, if anyone else wants to. I mean, I could... Um, just come back to Donna. Um, so, well, so at the beginning, we, we are, I asked, what is local government for? And, uh, and, we, and we got some really great responses there. And, um, but one of the things, you, you know, you were saying, it's service. Yes, it's services, but it's other things. And, um, but let's just come back to the services because that's something that we know we're kind of under pressure f around. So, are we seeing a rise in demand uh, for services provided by local governments? And what do you think the factors are that are driving this change? And maybe I can start with Adam. Yeah, so I think, and, I, and again, I'll, I'll caveat my response a little bit by saying, I, I, I want to be really clear, I'm not a, I'm not a local councillor, I'm not a local service provider, but I do work very closely with people and organisations who are and have done for many years. I think it is objectively true in Scotland and across the UK that there is a rise in demand for services provided by, by councils and their partners. Um, and that is, a, that is a consequence of demographic change, it's a consequence of health inequalities, it's a consequence of changing uh, e economic situations and, and regional inequality and, and all the things that are part of our social fabric that, that make that true. And so I think from where I sit, yes, it is true we are seeing a rise in demand. I think there is really interesting <coughs> insight to dig into that sits below that, though, in terms of what is the type of rising demand. We, we know, for those of us that work in, in social and economic policy, we know that the well-established issues of individuals, individuals with multiple and complex needs who often uh, present repeatedly in multiple uh, types of public services, whether it's um, health services, whether it's um, social services, criminal justice services, whatever it might be, we know there is a, a, a over the last uh, few decades there has been a real sharp uptick in um, uh, individuals who repeatedly uh, uh, will be seen by public service providers. And I think this, for me, it touches a little bit on your, your previous comment, and, and I don't want to in any way at all speak for Jonathan, but part of what he was saying, that I, as I understood it, was there is this really important distinction in, um, in how we conceptualise public services. Are they about administration, local administration of centrally uh, um, centrally ring-fenced funds or centrally uh, prescribed policy interventions, or are they about local problem solving to meet the, the needs of local individuals? And I, and I apologise very much to Jonathan if, if I'm misunderstanding that at all, um, because that's certainly what, what I heard from it. But I think it's a really important point because it connects to this idea of if we say there's a one-size-fits-all approach, which I'm not saying is the case, but if, if that is how things are interpreted and they're just to be delivered locally by local authorities, then I think we are somewhat doomed to fail in the provision of effective services and, and public policy interventions. But if we think that local government, going back to that point I was making about subsidiarity, if we think that local government is an important and powerful vehicle to respond to the problems locally, to respond to the opportunities locally as well, and to adapt and take evidence from, from across the UK, from across Scotland, from across the world on how to meet local challenges, then it can become a very powerful tool for effective public policy interventions that help improve people's lives and, in turn, their ability to live well and to thrive, as you were saying. But I think we're one of the things in Scotland that I think, again, from an independent point of view, has been debatable and, and I would say perhaps not consistent on, is what is our vision of the state? What is our clear articulation of what the role of the central government is, what the role of local government is, and even I would go a tier lower in terms of what is the role, as we've been touching on, of what you might call hyper-local government or community-focused uh, government. We don't really have a collective sense of that at the moment in Scotland. We've never really meaningfully since devolution got into that. And so how we start to conceptualise that, articulate that, debate that, is a really important part of where we go next in terms of the the topic of today's debate and where next for local government. We need a vision. We need a better vision than the one we have at the moment. 
You know, something I notice being in the role as convener or, or being on this committee, the local government committee, is that there's a lot, of, so a, lot, a lot of the legislation that's either coming through the committee or was passed in the last 25 years of the parliament. There's a lot of plans and requirements for local authority to do things. And what I'm noticing, just I'll give you an example of um, the Good Food Nation Act that came through, which requires, I see Tilly smiling in the front row because she was involved in that, um, the, you know, requiring it will eventually, it will come to local authorities to have to create a food plan um, around the food that's served in uh, their public kitchens, in their schools, and so on and so forth. But there's also, and I was at the Community Empowerment Act, there's another plan around local food, but it's different, but it's very, very confusing. People are really confused. It's like, oh, there's this, there's this food plan, and there's this food plan, but they require different things. So there's no, um, I, I feel like we need to kind of like take a step back, take a bit of time out, and look at all the different plans that our, our local um, government is required to deliver on, and actually try to create some coherence and consistency in all of those plans. I, I lost count at about 30 plans or 30 things that they had to do. And there's many, many more. Uh, but um, it was just something I noticed that we're, we're busy here in the parliament making these acts that then requires local authority to do something. But there isn't really the capacity or the time to look back and see how well designed that is and how well they all actually fit together with what, um, you know, what is already in place. I think that obviously the government, and we have government lawyers and folks working behind the scenes, behind the curtain as I call it, really trying to do a very good job. But sometimes it's, you've got, with the pace of the five year term, you've got to kind of keep moving. So it's quite difficult to kind of pull it all through and get it right. Donna, um, I'm gonna, let's try Jonathan again first actually, and then I'll come to you, Donna. Okay, let's try this again, see if I can be heard a bit, a bit oh, more clearly. Oh, yes. Great. Um, brilliant. So, look, what Adam said, he, he completely captured the point I was trying to make. So, thank you, Adam. But I think the, the challenge is, it's, you know, people in local government spend a huge amount of time trying to knit together all of these sort of plans that come, come from central government. And, you know, and this is not just a Scottish problem. We have this in England as well. It happens in, in Northern Ireland, in, in Wales. It's across the UK. And actually, in a way, I think we're, the only way to avoid that is just to stop doing it, just to let local places generate the plans themselves, rather than always trying to be knitting together. And, and that includes things that are really well-intentioned and sound great. So a live issue in Scotland right now, teacher numbers, and you know, local government receiving funding that it has to spend on boosting teacher numbers. Now, there are places, quite large parts of Scotland, where pupil roles are falling. They don't need more teachers, but they can't spend that money on other things. There are other ways they would spend it that would enhance educational opportunity for children in that area far more, but they can't. And we have to let those sorts of decisions be made by democratically locally elected leaders who understand the granularity, the texture, the specificness of their patch far better than anyone ever can from an office hundreds of miles away, that, that's just a sort of structural feature. You can't run complex services from the center. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, I, I would come back on that and say that the teacher number one for me is a tricky one because I'm in a region that's facing rural depopulation and it's always the kind of scary death knell is when the school roll starts to drop. And I think there's one primary school in the very northwest of Scotland where there's one, one, one child at the moment. And once that, once that school closes, uh, you end up with basically what some, somebody I'm working with calls a bedroom community, where it's, it's basically people who are retired that can live there because families can't come in. So there's a tricky thing with the teacher numbers. And I don't, I don't know if necessarily keeping teacher numbers in place and as a requirement is what's going to help us with that population piece. But we certainly need to try to keep schools for our rural communities and our island communities um, open, I, I think, from seeing what, but no, uh, come back on that. The question is just who, how to do that and who, where best to make the plan for doing that, yeah. I guess is my challenge. Okay, so you're saying 
have the teacher number decision at, at the council level rather than Scottish government exactly. level. Yep. Yes. Sphere, actually, that's what we're calling it now. Esther's in the audience. She was there when that happened. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Donna, you want to come in? Yeah, just um, going back to the issue of demand, Ariane, and is it all right if I say something controversial? Oh, yeah. Well, contro it controversy is great. <laughs> it might not be popular, but um, I think, yeah, there's a huge issue of demand. Uh, but we create the demand. Public services create the demand by the way we organise ourselves. So I think it's proven that new public management, this model of new public management of every organisation in a silo separately trying to deliver its budget savings or its, its spend, trying to deliver its key performance indicators individually, not working together in a team wrapped around a community or a family, doesn't work. Uh, so these repeat presentations that Adam talked about, um, that's because we organise ourselves in that way. We don't work in a relational way deeply with people, you know, and this is what we tried to do in Wigan and other uh, people are doing it much better than I ever did. In Gateshead, for example, some fantastic work there called the Liberated Method, where basically the council are working intensively with people, getting to know them, building a relationship with them and supporting them to have a good life. So rather than spending 80% of their resources on assessing them individually and referring them on to somebody else at a cost of a half a million a year per person, this is what it's been worked out at, without actually helping them at all, and then giving them a prescribed set of options that have been designed and commissioned in a darkened room without any input from, with people with lived experience. This would be, you know, music to Adam's ears, hopefully, in terms of the way that the recommendations that Carnegie uh, put forward. But we've got so many assets in local communities that we don't invest in. Things like hospices, for example. I'm doing some work with, I live in the Highlands now, we're doing some work with Kenny Steele at the Highland Hospice. Amazing asset-based work up there. <laughs> but, but trying to get the NHS board to appreciate that this is a way of helping accelerate delayed uh, delayed discharge from hospital is another, it's like, no, it's, it's, they see it as something totally different, but we're here as an asset in the local community, funded by local people running up mountains every weekend. You know, this is, we've got to find a new way. New public management is broken across the NHS, across councils, across police and across fire. We've got to find a new model of asset-based, community-based solutions. That's the future. Okay, that's an interesting point because we have the community planning partnerships in place in Scotland, which came out of the Community Empowerment Act. And I would imagine that in theory, that was maybe the idea. Some of the thinking is that you're bringing together all those services to have those conversations. But what you're saying is that that's not really, not, not really working. And I, I, I'm really aware that certainly here, and, uh, and, and on other, in other settings, we, I, I'm in the conversations where it is like we have to get out of the silo work and we need to get more into partnership working, but somehow we're not, it's, not, it's not happening. Can I, can yeah, come on in, Adam. Yeah, sure. So, I, well, again, I 100% I agree with, with Professor Hall because I, I think that you, you, you rightly said it's the future, and that's something I, I, I personally and professionally agree with. It's also the past, though. The Christie Commission, which was 2011, which, what's that, 13 years ago now? It talked about asset-based upstream prevention approaches to public service delivery. 13 years ago, and we've done very, very little about it. Now, I put my hands up as part of the ecosystem that all this is involved in. That's as much on uh, the third sector and independent as it is on, on anyone else. I'm not pointing the finger of blame at any one institution or individual. But for Scotland as a country and overall, we've totally failed to realise that. Mm. And we, we kick the blame and we say it's this, that, and that. We've got to lead on that. Could, we've been talking about that for, as I say, almost 15 years, 13 years, and we've not acted on it. We've not meaningfully looked at restructuring, which I know is a controversial thing and, and everyone gets sort of quite emotional about it, and I understand why, but we've not meaningfully looked at that. We've not meaningfully looked at funding. We've not meaningfully looked at this division of powers and where they sit. And going back to my point earlier, we've not meaningfully looked at what the vision of how the different aspects of our state interconnect. We've not mean, the, the structural point I reference is this challenge that we have of all the lines on a map in Scotland that we have created artificially mm -hmm. between health boards, between councils, between criminal justice systems, between, I mean, literally, you name it. I, I tried to count them once and 
pretty much lost the will to live mm. quite quickly. It just goes on and on and on and on. There are so many tiers of bureaucracy that get in the way because all those tiers of bureaucracy also come with governance, with administration, with boards that are risk averse, that say, well, we're not doing that or we're not using our money for that. And at the heart of a lot of this is measuring what matters. At the moment, we measure performance, to, again, to, to Professor Hall's point about this, um, a lot of the default mindset of um, per performance management and, and, and new public management. We've got to move away from that and move towards measuring what matters to people, looking at outcomes, not outputs, not, not even necessarily money in, but looking at the outcomes we can achieve, because that is a means to helping us frame how we deliver those outcomes differently through partnership, through uh, joining up services, through spending for outcomes, not spending for departmental budgets. And we're truthfully, we're so far away from that just now in Scotland. There was a lot in there. I just want to, I, no, and very good, yes, really good. I mean, some rich things that maybe we can pull into our work at the yeah. local government committee. But um, restructuring, you mentioned, what, what do you mean by that? So I, I, I suppose really what I mean, and I don't, I don't, I'm not sitting here with a view on what a, a different or better structure should necessarily look like, but it's more the principle that we've had devolution for 25 years, but we've never meaningfully looked at local government reform since devolution. Mm -hmm. We've done things like um, IGBs, the Integrated Joint Boards. We've looked at this drive towards um, uh, joining up of services, but not the lines on a map. And at the end of the day, it's the lines on the map between health boards, between councils, between um, uh, the, the, the judiciary system and all the bits that we know. And I know from, from my work experience, I'm sure many people here know a lot better than I do. It's when there are all those lines in the maps and all the bits where people can fall between service provision or they can fall between a referral from, oh, sorry, that's not my council, that's, oh, that's not my health board. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's where the most vulnerable in our society, the people who need the support of the state the most and the, and the supportive and enabling interventions can fall through. And it's something we have to look at, but it will have winners and losers. It will have political consequences. It's not easy. And a lot of political capital at a national level and local level would have to go on it. And so it's kind of one of those things that we don't really engage with very much, but we need to at least debate it more, I think, publicly in multiple forums and talk about it. Because if you, if you were to sit down and take a map of Scotland and start drawing out all the lines on a map where different services are sort of constitutionally, if you like, overlaid, it really quickly becomes really incoherent. And the number of boards and, and joint boards for this, that next thing we have, how somebody anywhere makes a decision to do something differently and then can scale it, because that's another thing when we talk about innovation and um, both, both Jonathan and Donna have, have, have done amazing work in this space. But when you look at the role of innovation in public services, Scotland is awash in 25 years with successful pilot programmes. What we're objectively pretty poor at mm. is scaling what's proven to work. And that a part of that, not all of that, but a part of that is about this challenge we have of all the lines on a map we have that get in the way of replicating what can be proven okay. to work in a place. Okay, so we've got to have a look at those lines on the map and <laughs> erase them a bit. Yeah. Jonathan, you've got your hand up. I'll bring you in and then you and Stephen, you indicated you wanted to come into. Thank you. So, look, I 100% agree with, with Donna and Adam, uh, but look, I was going to make a, a similar point to Adam, I guess, that the challenge is, yes, this is the future, but it's always, you know, for my whole career, this has been the future, and it's like, and it, it we never quite, so I, I feel that I'm starting to understand less and less what the real barriers are, because we know what sort of transformation we need. We've seen examples of it, you know, Donna mentioned Gateshead, we talked about Wig and earlier, we could, there's a whole industry, you know, which I've been part of, of sort of writing up case studies of all these amazing things that, where we transform our approach to services. And Donna's absolutely right, by the way, that we need to be really careful to distinguish where rising demand comes from real objective changes in the world and where it comes from stuff that we are just doing suboptimally. And, and both, both exist, but they can actually be quite hard to... To separate so we know we need this different approach a joined up preventative connected approach but we never quite get there and everything just sits as, as adam says in what, in what i sort of call pilot purgatory where we just go round and round and round these sort of pilots and we never move out of that and i and i've started to think i don't know the answer that it must be that we don't really understand what is stopping this happening. If we all agree time and time again, and we've been doing it for my whole career, you know, this is the way forward, this is what we should be doing, and yet we never scale it. What is it? What's stopping us? Is it just the lines on the map? 
Is it something deeper? I'm not sure I know, but I, I think we really need to interrogate what's the blockage to achieving the sort of future that so many of us, and that is so well evidenced, so many of us agree would, would take us forward. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, it, so um, the whole prevention piece, I, and you were saying earlier, Adam, like, you know, people kind of pass the buck around why we're not actually doing that. I do have a sense from my work here that it's challenging because we're busy firefighting and then how do you get the resource and the capital to actually move into that prevention space and one of the things that I'm quite interested in is is just housing like I, I love the model of co-housing could where this is where people have their own private space but they also have shared space and could we you know how do we find these intervention points through uh, to kind of get out from underneath the lack of direction in terms of moving to a more preventative asset-based place. So I was thinking about housing, if we could get people into co-housing, you immediately transform people's lived experience because you have people living in community and connection. There's a group in Orkney that you'll be aware of that they talk about they're, they're, they want to build co-housing for over 55s, and they say, we're not looking after each other, we want to look out for each other. And there's this whole understanding that people that live in co-housing uh, will stay out of the health, uh, you know, needing health services and uh, dementia care and that kind of thing because they're, they've got a lot of stimulation, they, the, the whole isolation issue is, 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 is removed and that kind of thing. So it's like, how do we find these, these things that we can use? I use the term intervention into the system just because of my design background. Maybe there's a better way of putting it. But that's the thing that I'm kind of quite interested in. You wanted to come in. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, just going back to the, the question, yes, there is increased demand and there's various reasons for that. I mean, poverty is the, one of the main drivers for it because the times are hard and the, uh, the, the, it sort of feeds into negative outcomes for health, negative outcomes for education, uh, leading to difficulties in getting the kids into school. Uh, and the requirement for additional support needs, which strains the uh, budgets that are, that are already strained. There's the, the aging demographic that we're, we're, we're all aware of. Uh, there's the issues around staffing, which have been caused largely by Brexit. Uh, there's issues around expectations. And there's issues around the, the, the problems that wouldn't occur if we had enough funding in the first place. Uh, and the problems that are caused by direction of funding starving areas that don't have the funding directed to them. Uh, the, and I, I always cite the example of roads, and every time I come to Edinburgh, the example gets uh, more and more pertinent. Uh, the, you wouldn't have such crappy roads if we had the, the, the money to, to provide all our, all our services. So the centralisation, I would say, doesn't help this. Uh, the direction of funding is centralisation by any other name. And what it does is it prevents us from marshalling resources in a way that perhaps would allow us to do the kind of preventative work that uh, Christy spoke about 13 years ago. Uh, because so often we're fixing the, the, the symptoms rather than the, the, the causes. Uh, so fundamentally we need to, to get away from the centralisation. We need to empower local government to come together across the, its jurisdiction to carve up the money better, and we need to consider expanding the, the, the competences of local government as well, because we've seen uh, increasing silos, not just because of the direction of funding, but also because of the change in shape of local government uh, in the form of <coughs> the examples like water, uh, public health, fire, police, uh, and uh, I think economic development uh, also, uh, the inability to, to, to fund economic development to the extent that we like, and the, the, the move towards agencies such as SDS, uh, monopolising the um, employability side of things. Uh, we find the, the, too often the government wants to ride to the rescue with a, to, to solve a problem uh, and you know, the indirect and the funding to be seen to be solving a problem. It's starving us with that ability to, to solve the problem. SDS, just for folks. Sorry, Skills Development Scotland. Yeah. 
Sorry. acronym city here. Um, but yeah, I do it all the time too. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, think that, I think those are really you know, good points around the, 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 the changing shape. Can I just well, make one more point yeah. on top of that? <laughs> I mean, the, in, in empowering local government, we'd also need to empower our community planning partners as well, because they, we have the community planning partners partnerships set up, and we have the, the agencies appear in there, and we do have police, and we do have fire. And if uh, all these bodies were uh, empowered more locally, if they were themselves decentralised to an extent, the people would contribute far more to community planning mm -hmm. partnerships, and it would be a step along the, the way to what I'm describing here. Yeah, and I think uh, in the Verity House Agreement, community pa planning partnerships are, are named as mm -hmm. an important vehicle. I mean, they're, yep. or they're seen to be, but yes, but again, in the committee, we did a piece of work around community planning partnerships and made a lot of recommendations to the government, which they're not really taking on board, but maybe we need to just keep having that conversation about, about that kind of thing. Um, I just want to say, I'm going to cue folks up in the audience. In, in a few minutes, it's going to be over to you with your burning questions. So just make sure you're generating those. We've got about, we'll have about half an hour, 40 minutes of time for you to be asking questions. If I could be optimistic, there's another point I just want to okay, make. Okay, come on in and then I'm going to bring Donna. I don't make the, the, the point about restructuring. You raised the question about restructuring <coughs> and the, uh, maybe a reluctance to, to grasp the nettle. I think uh, from Costler's perspective, I mean, we're very happy to have a kind of honest discussion uh, uh, as long as there's honest commitment behind honest discussion uh, because we're embarking on uh, a lot of work. Uh, we have, we're looking at the single authority model, mm -hmm. uh, which would bring together, well, it would kind of turbocharge what the aspirations for the uh, health and social care partnerships were but also bring in the, the other bodies that would co contribute in the, maybe the manner of that start to look like, outline earlier. There's a local governance review, which is ongoing. It seems to be <laughs> ongoing forever. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. the Associated Democracy Matters 2 conversations. And uh, uh, as was alluded to in the conversation we were having before we came in the room, the uh, Commission for Strengthening Local Democracy it was convened by COSLA at the time of the... Uh, a, a independence referendum. It wasn't a Costla commission, but uh, Costla originated it and made some, uh, I thought, very good recommendations uh, uh, about the future shape of local democracy here. And I, I was on it, so I should declare an interest. <laughs> <laughs> but they also within Costla, we were uh, doing the kind of necessary naval gazing as well, and just asking what the future might look like through our uh, innovating, developing, and transforming special interest group. So the rest. I, uh, a willingness to, to, to look at what future structures uh, might uh, look like. But, you know, there, absolutely, yeah, there is a reluctance to uh, consider a structure where there would be less local government, because if you have less local government, you're going to have less local democracy mm -hmm. and we'll have a poorer system. Yeah, certainly. Okay, Donna, come on in. Hang on a moment. Back on, John. There we go. Go on ahead. John, sorry, thanks, Ariane. It was just to come back on Jonathan's challenge around why are we not implementing Christie? Because Christie, you, you're all right, Christie, I think was it influenced a lot of our thinking uh, in Wigan at the time. I think it was ahead of its time, but it's not been turned into real practical implementation on the ground in many places. Um, and I think the, the barrier is leadership of that type with that vision that Christie uh, had. Uh, and I think, I'd, again, uh, something that I, I know Andy Burnham's been saying that Scottish Scotland should have mayors, a mayoral kind of leadership model or someone who has got that ability to galvanise people across the different organisations together in a place. So it's place driven, community driven, uh, directly electable and um, in, a, in a position where they can actually sounds horrible to say but bang some heads together it's a lot of it is individual organizational ego governance that gets in the way uh, and prevents joint working around people individuals families and communities that's the barrier no matter how many strategies or reviews or reports anybody does that's not going to change that kind of lack of leadership that vacuum of leadership uh, so I, just a, a personal view okay thanks very much for that i'd be interested to hear um because we a committee not necessarily publicly, but we, we do talk a bit about the whole mayor idea, and I'd be interested to hear what we think about that here in Scotland. Would that be, would that be a useful fit, or has that be, become another layer? 
maybe I'll go to someone else because you've said quite a bit first. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jonathan, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, Donna's right. It's about leadership. I guess that the question then is, well, how do we get that leadership? I think mayors are an answer. I don't... You are know, research centre at LJU is about to do a piece of research, so I don't know, I shouldn't like prejudge it, but they're going to be looking at Man Greater Manchester and West Midlands ten years on, what's worked, what hasn't worked, a piece of work we're going to do with Queen Mary University. But I think broadly what that will show is that it does have some of the impacts that you know, it's not a magic bullet, but it does have many of the impacts that Donna's talking about. It provides single points of accountability to the community. Uh, I think mayors were pushed by the coalition, by George Osborne, etc., because they provided a single point of accountability up to government. But it is also true they provide accountability to the community. It does provide a place where you can you can do that kind of strategic, I was going to say banging of heads, that's probably a bit adversarial, the, the strategic facilitation and bringing of people together. Um, and you can get rid of those people if they don't deliver, because they're up for election every four years. So they have all of those advantages. Local government in England, uh, this is a much less, I think, developed conversation in Scotland, local government in England has pushed back quite hard against them. The new UK government is very, very, very keen on mayors. So mayors as a concept are not going away. I think that is a conversation that I suspect will be coming to Scotland. Uh, so it will be interesting to see folks in Scotland marshal their arguments on both sides of that. But you know, whatever those arguments are, a priori, in sort of global terms, for example, the idea of a mayor of Edinburgh or a mayor of Glasgow is not an odd one. You know, most most other countries look at us and think, who, well, who is it? Who do I talk to? There are other answers to that question, but I think, you know, my frustration in England over the past few years has been people tend to say, no, mayor, no, no, we don't want mayors. Okay. But then what is the answer to the questions that we have posed to those questions around accountability around people? If you don't want a mayor, there needs to be a different answer to that question. I think there are alternative answers, but we need to, you know, people need to get those those lined up because otherwise, you know, and Donna gives us an, an, a useful way of framing that. Where does the leadership come from then? And how do we move beyond this? You know, if, it, if and if our answer is well, it comes from local government leaders, it comes from, okay, but they haven't been, you know, then how do we move forward? Then Then why are we not blocked on this? So I think that that conversation is is one that, we, and it picks up on Adam's point about a fundamental conversation about the structure of the state, our constitution, who does what, where decisions are made. That's that's what you know. That conversation needs to be had. And uh, and it, I just quick come in, and then I'll bring you in, and then I'm going to go to questions from the audience. Um, so is that where the local government's review should be? taking us, kind of looking at that, kind of looking at the lines on the map, looking at where leadership could come from. Would that be something that should be coming out of that work? Yes. Okay, we better get that local governance review back on track, Jim, Adam and then Stephen. So I, I don't, I don't, and Carnegie UK doesn't have an ideological position on the, the concept of mayors in terms of for or against. But what we are really interested in, as I said, is the concept of subsidiarity is one we believe in because we've, we think there's a, a growing and, and evolving uh, body of evidence that says when decisions are made locally, they, they, they tend to stick better and meet the needs of, of local people better. But what I think is really important in this, and, and this is a very personal thing, not, not speaking on behalf of my employer, but I think that I'm always wary of the latest political thing. Uh, if, if you know whatever that is, and I don't just mean it with mayors, I mean it in general, because it's easy for for elect politicians of all types to to jump on that thing because it, it's something to campaign on. We've got to bring this back, and I think this supports what Jonathan says, and, and for what it's worth, I, th I think it aligns with the, any debate, conversation, review of local government. What is the outcome? Don't look at it through the prism of the vehicle. Look at it through the prism of what are we trying to achieve? What is the outcome we are trying to achieve via the structures of our state? Let, and let's look, let's not have any sacred cows in that equation. Let's look at everything and say, what is the structure here? Is it delivering the outcomes we want for the people we all are here to serve and support? Or is it not? And if it's not, where is it failing? And let's be dispassionate about that. Let's be driven by evidence. Let's be driven by uh, multiple sides of debate and all that and focus on the outcome, not saying this thing, whatever the thing is, whether it's mayors or whatever comes next or, or alongside, 
Is that the vehicle to it? Let's look at the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Let's gather evidence, views and opinions and come up with a vision of what we think the coherent state should be to deliver those outcomes. And if that includes mayors, so be it. If it includes other yeah. things, so be it. But it's got to be driven by the outcomes. Yeah, that's, I think that's very helpful not to get stuck in the structure. It's, it's actually what mm. we're trying to do and how do we get there. I'm actually going to go to questions in the audience now because we've we're moved on with, with time. But, but, it, but another thing I just want to say is that another reason that I'm really interested in seeing, uh, you know, kind of power at the most local level is because we've got a climate and nature crisis. And it's going to be people at the most lo local level that are going to be having to tackle those, you know, tackle that and respond to it, and it's going to be different in different parts of Scotland, and and so we need to really, you know, give that power as locally as possible. And power to me means decision making, but also the the, the, the funding to do that. Are you so, sure you're not on the hot take because Lord, okay, come on, the hot take, come on, <laughs> hot take. I mean, the, the concern about mayors would be it's a, it's an impact of a, another structure, and I mean, in, in England we've seen some areas have been for it and run with it and other areas have been massively against it. So, you know, it, how it comes about would obviously be very crucial. And, I mean, there is a, a, a risk or maybe a reality that the, this has become a, a more a presidential role and you have to ask where the, the uh, connection with local democracy is at this mm. point. Uh, I think in the... Scotland and the polling informally, the, the uh, political groups at Kostler, uh, there's not really an uh, enthusiasm to return to regionalisation and there's not really a, an enthusiasm for mayors either. Uh, I think the feeling is that the all-purpose authorities have reduced silos, have been a success and you know, have potential. But we, we do see uh, say councils coming together as city regions and as areas in regional growth deals for you know positive reasons that are uh, shown mutual benefit and as long as this mutual benefit uh, continues they will come together consensually to, to do this and i think this is an important thing that it should be something that's allowed to happen organically that they are em empowered to do this but i think it's very important to in order to retain the local democracy, any council that doesn't like what's happening to them as part of this can say I'm out of here and leave. Okay, I think that's very good. I'm glad we got that. I'm glad we got the hot take. Um, <laughs> yeah, really important because you, you're obviously you're getting the opinions from um, the, all the council groups. Um, so I'd now like to uh, invite audience the audience to participate. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and keep it raised until the microphone is passed to you. And it'd be helpful if you could keep your questions and points brief so we can enable as many people as possible the opportunity to participate. And depending on the, the demand, I think I might take a couple of questions. Okay, we've got a lot, a lot of hands going up. That's great. So I think I'll take a couple of questions at a time um, and, and then see how we get on. So I'm going to go for the person in the front row with the blue shirt and then um, the front row again. See, front row seats, front row again here in the... Polka dot shirt. Esther, yeah, go on. Thank you very much. And it's, it's, it's a really, really interesting session. So thank you all for your contribution. And there seems to be a lot of consensus on the surface. And I just want to tease out a bit more what you mean by local and what you mean by subsidiarity. And I'm thinking particularly of participatory budgeting in Scotland started as community choices post Christie and has really turned into a mechanism for giving out small community grants. So do you see a place for genuine participatory budgeting mm -hmm. where local people are involved in decisions about where money goes for core services? Great question. And, and, and Esther, your question. It's interesting, that awful word subsidiarity and that we've talked about Christie. If you go back to the convention scheme for the parliament launched in 95, it absolutely committed to subsidiarity, meaning power pushed out as close to the people as we could possibly get. And I've just read something else that tells me that in the Wheatley report in the 70s that created our regions and districts, they, he talked about hyperlocalism. We've talked today predominantly, I think Donna might be the exception, through the prism of services. Mm -hmm. And we're still talking about services that we do to people. And I think that's where the danger lies. Like Stephen, I've got real reservations about mayors as another level. It's a solution to a question we've not even asked yet. 
But to me, it's about leadership and it's about culture. And it's about saying whatever size the council is, they can do what you're describing. But one of the things we would have to do to do that is to give councils serious fund finance raising powers. And again, that has not been addressed and it hasn't been talked about today. So could councils raise much more money if they were given the freedom to raise the kinds of taxes that I think they have this, the capacity to raise? And that would allow them then to do serious community involvement in deciding who to spend that money. Can I just clarify on that um, that point, Esther? Uh, are you talking about the general power of competence, that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Being able yeah. to raise the money and decide what to spend it on and move away from ring fencing and let Scottish Government do the bit that we need them to do at the Scottish level and let local government get on and do the rest. Okay, great. So let's... Um, so we've got the, the uh, great question about bringing in the idea of real, genuine participatory budgeting, which is kind of talking about core services, but then also, um, yeah, giving councils the power to raise serious funds. So who wants to pick up? I think they're, they're actually very connected in my mind. Um, yeah, Stephen. Happy to, to make a start. Um, yeah, I mean, the uh, participatory budgeting is a, it's a, it's a good question. And they ask about the genuineness, of it because I mean I can see that uh, in, in some of the, the aspects of where it's been applied by councils, it can seem like tokenism. Uh, and I mean you know, that's maybe a, maybe a fair observation. Uh, I mean in responding to that, the uh, local government is meeting our targets set us by the Scottish government on participatory budgeting, uh, and. I, I, I say meeting our targets because we're the only part of the public sector that has any targets or any obligation to do any uh, participatory budgeting uh, at, at all. I would say that in the example of my own local authority where we're given money to the, the community councils, that's a form of participatory budgeting. We're devolving the, the funds to other people to do with them uh, as to see fit. But I think the uh, returning to your question, absolutely we can do more on the participatory budgeting side of things and I think what Donna's been describing in, in Wigan and uh, what uh, I hope she maybe elaborate on here uh, is an example of uh, where that can go. It, it's easier to do these things if you have enough money to do everything that you want uh, because uh, the, the current situation is we, we don't have the, the money to, to provide the, the services, uh, the, the statutory services, basically, that we, we have to, to provide. And the, the idea of extending discretionary funding is one that we would love to do, but we're constrained uh, from doing by the kind of harsh reality of the, the, the funding that we're in. And this comes back to Esther's question. Uh, because we're so dependent on the Scottish government's uh, uh, granted expenditure coming towards us, uh, the, it means that we have no discretion if there's a council tax, which is you know, one of the worst things that they can, the Scottish Government can do to us in terms of limiting our, our discretion with the council tax. It's our primary form of lo local taxation. Uh, and the, well, I mean, it's essentially the only form of local taxation until the, the tourist tax or until the, the workplace parking levy uh, comes in. Uh, so the, more discretion on local taxation in a, a, a way to obviously develop it by our communities, because our communities are not going to respond well to taxation that we can't justify us and kick us out at the end of the, the uh, <coughs> electoral term. So, you know, it has to be uh, something that's supported by the communities. But there's also the, the aspects in Jonathan's work, analysing the, the, uh, how it's done in other nations, where uh, a, a form of uh, or a portion of the national taxation coming down to local government uh, would obviously be more enabling uh, for us. And this is the kind of things that I think we have to discuss and essentially we are discussing in uh, uh, the, the work that's going on to develop a new fiscal framework with the Scottish Government, just a, a, an understanding of where the funding is going to be year on year rather than being driven by kind of political priorities and political expediency on an annual basis. Okay. Uh, Donna, uh, Stephen mentioned you. I would like to bring you in. You haven't put your hand up, but I'd like to bring you in and see if we can hear a bit more about the work in Wigan or, 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 or the other experiences you have um, so that we can get a sense in the room of positive potential. 
Yeah, thanks very much, um, Ariane. We had lots of visits from the Scottish Government, actually, to Wigan when we were creating the deal in the first few years. Uh, and so that was that was great. I think um, really enjoyed working with colleagues from um, Scottish Government. But so that the idea of it was really that the outcome. So Adam really quite rightly says you start with the outcome. And uh, our focus was, uh, the per core purpose was to reduce uh, the gap in healthy life expectancy between the most the poorest areas of Wigan and the most affluent to reduce that gap. That was the core purpose of what everything that we were trying to do was to create that. And in the end, at the end of the first seven years, we'd managed to add an additional seven years of healthy life expectancy in the most deprived wards. So that was the big outcome that the King's Fund kind of thought was remarkable. And that's why they wrote an evaluation of it, which is online. You can see it. It's a couple of years old now. But what we did was we we did exactly what was described there around community budgeting um, and uh, involving local people in redesign of of services, uh, participatory budgeting. Um, so it wasn't just around asking people um, what we should spend the money on. It was around as well as well as that investing in um, local community projects. So it was highlighted in a recent Demos report for that reason. So we created this community investment fund. The ideas came from local people rather than public servants sat in rooms without the input of people on, on the receiving end of services. And they were preventative in their nature. So they were um, asset based community projects. Wigan's a big rugby town, so lots around sport, lots around. So we had a rugby memories project which came from Wigan Warriors, the, the, the rugby club, and we would invest in. So rather than call it talk about a dementia support project, it wasn't stigmatised. It was to support people to relive their memories of fantastic rugby matches they've been to over the years and to come together. We, we managed to stop doing things that didn't work <laughs> and saved um, over 180 million by stopping doing the things that didn't work. And we found there was a lot of stuff we did because we, we felt we had to keep the inspectors off our backs and it would keep us safe as public servants, but it wasn't benefiting people at all. And lots around children's services, lots around... Um, the risks attached to keeping families together and supporting families to be um, to be uh, good good parents and and to have uh, children to have really good outcomes. So we stopped doing a lot of that assessment referral, multiple agency assessments. Eighty percent of our time was spent on that, and we just stopped it. We stopped eligibility criteria. You know those things that that mean they have a deficit model to public services. We try to keep people out. Classic example: eating disorder services. I ran the the health service in Wigan as well as the council uh, at one point and I was shocked to see that eating disorder services were rationed on the basis of body mass index so basically you're told sorry your body mass index is too high go away when you get to a certain BMI then I can help you when you're really much more seriously ill and it'll cost a lot more um, so you know the whole this sorry it's going back to this new public management model it's broken we need the leadership to fix it and whatever it takes to implement Christie you know, I'm, I'm sure we've just that's the incentive is it's broken. It's a model that's completely defunct. But that, OK, but thank you so much for the, those examples. And that feels very exciting, all that kind of possibility and uh, and the, this piece around being the, you know, community input and asset based. And that seems like a really important bit. So I'm, I'm starting to think about other people I can have conversations with to try to to kind of get some more of that happening. But I think, Adam, you were talking earlier, and I know you want to come in, um, about the fact that Scotland is awash with all these pilot projects, but how do we scale this kind of thing up? So, um, but maybe you want to come back to um, powers of competency or PB. I'll, I'll, I'll come very briefly, because I'm conscious there's lots of other yeah, people want to come in. Hands, um, yeah. And, and also because I could talk about this forever and no one wants to hear that. Um, <laughs> but just a couple of observations in, in general in response to both questions. I, I believe very much, and our, our work at Carnegie UK would, would support the idea that both participatory democratic initiatives as well as deliberative democratic initiatives are really important and are really effective at improving individuals and communities' sense of democratic well-being, that sense of connection, the sense of, of trust and influence. 
but there are significant risks associated with them if they are done poorly. And there's a, there's a, there's an, a growing body of evidence from, from other organisations, Demos was referenced there, one, but there's many more that talk about how to do these things well. But one of the parts that is missing in, in that evidence base is how you then mainstream what these processes recommend. So how, how do you have accountability from a citizen's panel or a citizen's jury? How do you have a mainstreaming of the mechanisms of accountability and delivery from things that are recommended or endorsed via this process, these processes? I think there can also, and this isn't so much about participatory budgeting, but more about deliberative and participatory processes, there is a risk of tokenism. If they are established to basically endorse something that's already been decided, they have to, where they have been proven nationally and internationally to be very effective, it's when there is a humbleness associated with them, where we, where the, the, the commissioner of those processes is saying, we don't know the answer to this problem. We want to work with you, community, individual citizens, help to help us solve this problem, to work together. We're not coming at it saying, this is what we're actually going to do at the end, though, so if you could just kind of rubber stamp that for us. Because that, that does happen, has mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. They have to be genuine, they have to be humble, and they have to be mainstreamed in terms of accountability and delivery. So that's a very important point about participatory uh, democratic initiatives. The, the very the quick other point I would make are, is alluded to in both the taxation stuff as well as um, the, the, the general dynamic of money in this country, uh, the UK as a whole, but Scotland in particular. I think one of the things that has been really underdeveloped in 25 years of devolution is our approach to public finances. Um, in terms of the, and, and I'm not saying there aren't incredibly clever, much wiser than me, far wiser than me, I don't know anything about it really, but just in terms of the general debate around how money is, is portioned and allocated and used, we're still very, very much in a transactional mindset. And there are so many great examples across the UK, it's, yes, some in Scotland, but particularly in places like Wales, where they've done things like Innovate to Save in their public services, where they've done blended approaches to um, uh, grants to, to proven innovation and then repayable loans that deliver a saving to the public purse over far longer term timeframes than we even debate or talk about here in Scotland. We, we've really got an, a fairly unsophisticated public policy debate around how we use money to achieve outcomes in Scotland. It's very short term and it's very transactional. And that undermines a lot of the, 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 the efforts around change because we're stuck in this annualised funding yeah. mindset. And we don't have to be. There's nobody saying that's what we... With the, there's, I know everyone says, oh, but the budgets. We all know what the, roughly the budgets. We might, might argue over pounds and pence and, and bits at the margins, but the, grant, the block grant has never fallen below a certain level. It's unlikely to ever do that. So use that as your starter for 10. You know, we, we can, there, there's a much more sophisticated way that we could model a lot of this and think about innovative ways of blended mm -hmm. finance to achieve outcomes. But we don't really get into that very often in Scotland. The conversation stops at quite a top level. OK, I think that's a panel for next year. <laughs> really, really, I think that would be a really good uh, thing to get into. I'm going to... You might be um, overestimating how many people are interested in blended finance. It's probably not many. Well, but. <laughs> but, I mean, but I think the whole thing about... Uh, there is a... I think people are interested in getting away from the annualised budget yeah. constraints. I'd like to see a show of hands. I think there were some folks in the back of the room. Yeah, so right at the back of the room and, uh, and here at the front. Yep. Uh, there's a, a lot of talk about subsidiarity, and it's interesting how successful some of the smaller scale uh, uh, initiatives, like the ones in Wigan, and of course Orkney, which is, uh, I think, the smallest uh, council mm -hmm. in Scotland. If they can do it, why are so the other councils so big? You talk about a mayor of Edinburgh or a mayor of Glasgow, what about the mayor of Leith? What about the mayor of Perth? There doesn't seem to be any talk about subsidiarity in terms of the democratic uh, machinery, as if uh, we, have to, we have to stay with the size of local authorities we've got, which, as many people have pointed out, is extremely centralised by comparison with any other uh, developed country. Okay, thank you very much for that question. And, and down here at the front. Thanks very much for running around with the mic here, lady in the stripy top. Yeah. Uh, Esther Robertson made the point about a local tax levy or discretion to alter it. Given that the current administration already has a power to levy over and above what people are paying in other parts of the United Kingdom, 
and given the remarks by Tom Hunter about brain drain and therefore finance drain, would local authorities see a similar drain if they introduce draconian tax levies locally? Okay. Um, thanks very much. So, so one around local, are we going to lose people if we get the local tax levy in? And then I think there's something at the back, was, and maybe you picked it up differently, but I, I kind of picked it up around um, why do we have the size of councils that we have? And I know that that's certainly the work from our Boundaries Commission and having to have a certain amount, a number of uh, people living in those areas, but maybe there's another way we can think about dividing that up. So anyone want to pick that up? Jonathan, you've got your hand up. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's a really good question about size, but I also think we can get a bit distracted by it. I mean, I guess, you know, we, we look at local government across the country, across the world, I think there is amazing work done by some tiny councils. There's amazing work done by some massive councils. I'm not sure that the size of council, there are, there are some interesting questions around it in relation to democracy, but I, you, when people get really obsessed about the kind of structure of local government, I always kind of think, well, actually, you can make any of this work. It's actually, it's about relationships, it's about culture, it's about how people operate, and you can do that across almost, you know, so we see it in England, some people say you've got to get rid of two-tier local government and other people saying, no, you've got to keep it. And you obviously unitarization is a debate that you know, is, that's long gone in, in Scotland. But any of these things can be made to work. It's about, it's about what we do and, and how we do it, not necessarily the kind of structural structures we do it within. The tax point is, 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 is pick up Mrs. Packard's point, is really, is really, you know, I don't think this is so much about allowing local authorities to levy taxes, though I think they ought to be able to bear that risk and make those decisions. But what we see when we look at other jurisdictions, other countries, is that the UK is an outlier in that in nearly everywhere else, local government has a far broader range of revenue sources. And that just makes it more resilient and, and more flexible. The point Stephen was making was not necessarily about local authorities uh, imposing further taxes, but about giving local authorities a, a slice of, yes, yeah, so one of the ideas that is done elsewhere and that is talked about a lot is a slice of national taxation that vires across to local authorities based on their competencies, based on their responsibilities. And again, a feature of other countries is that all of those things are not subject to annual kind of political bun fights. They are set out constitutionally. And there is what, what we call embedded autonomy, where local authorities have freedom in spending and raising money, but that operates within a fixed system that everyone understands and that is predictable year on year. And I think in some ways we have the worst of all worlds because it's short term, it's overdriven by central government. It doesn't, it doesn't allow entrepreneurialism and inventiveness from local authorities, but neither does it give them predictability and, and stability. So we kind of fall in between two stools. Okay, great. Thanks for that. I, I'm, just, I'm going to bring you in, but, and then I'm going to, that's going to, we're going to have to wrap, um, and I'm just going to queue you up, because I, I, this is something we didn't discuss behind the curtain before we came in, but uh, you're all going to get asked to sum up our discussion today, you're all going to get a minute. So I'll just let you know that now so you can be thinking about that. And then we're going to um, close up for the, for the afternoon because I, I know that people are probably going to other things. So come on in, Adam, and others can be thinking about your kind of one-minute uh, stump speech. So I, I just wanted to come in particularly to, to, to really support some of the points that Jonathan was making because I, I completely agreed, despite having, obviously I made the, the comments and remarks earlier, but the structures, and I do believe that it's important because I think objectively they're getting in the way, the structures we have at the moment, of, of trying to do things. But it can be that takes up all the oxygen in the room and the debate, and it is not the be-all and end-all. And I think the, the point that the, the lady made about tax is a really important one. We, we're just starting a bit of work at Carnegie uh, called Financing the Future, which is looking in the round at a slightly more holistic approach to how governments of different types generate revenue and then allocate that revenue towards outcomes, or, or rather how they often don't join those things up, but the, but the premise is what we, could, what we could do better. And I think, what, although that work is at its very beginning, the one thing I just wanted to jump into to really support is to say part of this is the challenge of not being able to look at this holistically with, and, and to back up Jonathan's point, around a kind of fixed 
vision or a fixed ideology or a fixed model of how this works. What we've had a lot of in Scotland since devolution is a little bit more devolution here, a part, one, one tax lever there, one bit of devolved tax to local government there. And so if you devolve one thing, whether it's to the Scottish government or to local government, parking levy, for example, then of course that takes up all the focus. You go, well, how are we going to use this? And then you get quite passions run quite high on either end of that spectrum and people feel strongly one way or another. What we need to be able to do is have that debate holistically in the room and say, how does this interact with all the other things, with all the other powers that we have? Not so we're having this one ideological driven debate around whether we believe or don't believe in a particular tax. But that limits our ability to have a really sophisticated and nuanced debate on, the, again, not to sound like a broken record, but on the role of the state and all the component parts of the state to act coherently, because we're, we're looking at single levers in isolation and not the whole too often. And, and it's only, I think, by being able to look at the whole, to, to address the lady's point, that we can think meaningfully about this idea of, well, what about challenges of mobility or, or wealth mobility or people taking different you know, non-income tax away or, or wealth and, and fixed assets and whatnot? We can't do that if we're just looking at one tax. We've got to look at issues that are as complex as tax in the round and Again, that's not a debate we've had much of in Scotland in the last 25 years. Okay, great. So there's a, a cue for something that we need to we need to be doing. So thanks for all the questions. I know there were more, and that's great to see that people are enthusiastic or, and want to kind of dig into more detail and uh, around the local government issues that that we we face, and, and also kind of picking up on this discussion. So. Um, over to you panellists, one minute summing up. I'm not going to put a timer on, so please try to keep it succinct. But, uh, Stephen, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll just go with eight quick bullet points. Okay. I would say the local connection is essential. Subsidiary, subsidiarity has been identified as important and a, a driver for empowerment and change. One size does not fit all. We didn't say that, but that was implicit in lots of stuff that was being discussed. Uh, and that it's not a post-good lottery. Uh, more resilient funding is essential, and we need to work to find that. Uh, suitably empowered local government uh, will be better equipped to implement a preventative agenda and be able to respond to their community's needs and aspirations. All right, that was really great modelling. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> that that's me evidence to your next committee <laughs> session as well. <laughs> great. OK, uh, going online. Uh, Donna, do you want to come in with your kind of wrapping up? Yeah, mine, mine won't be as succinct as that. Um, but I think we've had a really interesting discussion. Thank you for facilitating it so well. And I've really enjoyed listening to, to all of the panel. Um, I think the things that stick out for me are around defining core purpose of local government and really being clear about that. Uh, really exploring the barriers to Christie implementation, because I think Scotland's ahead of the game with having this amazing vision. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. And that, and it still talks about public service reform in Scotland. It's not been talked about in England for, for the last 14 years, but it's constantly been talked about in Scotland, which is fantastic. But it's the implementation and something gets lost in translation. And we end up with this kind of policy spaghetti, don't we, of, of competing and overlapping policies and strategies that don't quite fit together around the place and the person. I wasn't a fan of mayors, I'll be honest. Um, and then I got to work with Andy as his head of public service reform. And I saw the difference having one key person makes to getting agencies to work together. I'd never seen anything like it, I'll be honest. So I do understand the concerns about the mayoral model. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it certainly wouldn't be my favourite thing, but it, it can actually make things move. Um, and I think Jonathan's absolutely right. It is leadership. It's culture, leadership, behaviours. Public servants on the front line can see that a lot of the money is going between the gaps in services. And they can see they're really frustrated that leaders can't see this. Um, and they want us to change. Communities want us to change. But we stop and we get stuck on new public management models of silos and hierarchy. And we have to change it urgently. Thanks. Super. Thanks very much for that. I'm going to go to Jonathan and then I'll come to Adam. Jonathan. Yeah, this always reminds me when we do LGIU events, I always come across a bit at the end where the team sneak in this thing that says, Jonathan, to summarise. And I, I duck it then and I, I'll duck it now. But, but three very quick points. Talking about local government is not, yeah, it sounds niche or local government. 
it's about everyone's success. National success has local foundations. If you don't have an effective, successful local government, you can't have national success. So it matters to everyone. Totally echo Donna's points, Adam's points about the need to have a much bigger conversation about the purpose and structure of the state nationally and locally. The fact that we don't have a constitution doesn't mean we shouldn't have constitutional conversations. And actually, Scotland has shown a lot more willing. I know we could talk about the challenges, et cetera, around Verity House, the governance reviews, but the fact that Scotland is willing to get into those conversations is a head start that you should capitalise on because Scotland is ahead of other parts of the UK in that. And finally, I would just say something about our attitude to change. And whenever we try and change something, we sort of demand, it's this pilot point, we demand a mountain of evidence that the change will be good. Well, we've got an even bigger mountain of evidence that what we're doing now isn't working. So maybe we should just slightly flip our assumptions on that and be a bit more willing to take a risk. Okay, great. That's a good, a good push in that direction. Adam, you get the final yeah, word. Thank you. Um, it's all, it's, I find it hard going last because everyone said all the things that I was maybe going to say. So I'll try and say different things and things I've not already said. I, I, you would expect me to say that I, I strongly believe in the idea of, of focusing on, a, on an outcome or outcomes over process, over inputs, over departmental vision. We need to, what are we trying to achieve? And let's be dispassionate about that in terms of how we get there. Now, of course, we also have to be realistic. We're not, you know, we're not starting from a blank slate in any of this, and nor would we want to. But I think focusing on the outcomes is critical. Measuring what matters is also critical. And there's two other things I would end on. They've been touched on by others, but one is around leadership. And I think, notably in Scotland, um, the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission have talked a lot about the role of leadership, and it's been referenced today uh, by, by colleagues on the panel. Leadership is incredibly important, and a really key component of that is about embracing risk. Our approach to risk and risk aversion and risk mitigation and risk management has undermined a lot of efforts across the, the piece uh, to, to change things. And the final thing I would say is I think it's really important to end on hope because there's a lot in this conversation that can drag you down a bit because it's really complicated, it's complex and it's difficult and it's slow. But it's also, I find it incredibly energising and hopeful because the, the people on this panel, not least, but many uh, peers and colleagues in the room, there's incredible work out there. There's incredibly committed people. There's incredibly passionate communities and people want things to be better where they are. And I think it's the focusing on hope and focusing on an ability to make small changes can quickly add up. And it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of things to be really hopeful about. Great. OK, thank you very much for that. So I just want to do a round of applause and then we're going to, because I, to acknowledge that, uh, and then I've got to say a few more things. But I just want to yeah, say thank you for your contribution. And I want to thank you all for coming and having an interest in local government and, and uh, the discussion here. So thank you to Councillor Professor Stephen Heddle, to Professor Donna Hall, CBE, Adam Lang, and Dr. Jonathan Carwest for your <coughs> insightful contributions, and to our partners, COSLA, who uh, helped organize this. I also would like to thank our, our BSL interpreters, Megan Frickleton and Jenny Laird, who've been at the back of the room very busily making sure that we're communicating to many more people. I'd also like to remind you uh, to please uh, fill out the survey that you will have received automatically when you booked your Eventbrite uh, tickets and we do have some paper copies I think somewhere in the room uh, that's really important for us to get the feedback around the festival and how we can make it even better than it already is and I'd also like to take the opportunity to remind you that there are many more festival events taking place all the way through until Friday and this includes a panel on whistleblowers tomorrow at 11 a.m. followed by a panel on standards in public life at 1.15 and then a lively discussion on the US election at 3.15 p.m. So I hope that you are able to come along to more of these sessions. I know that in 2010, when I moved back um, from the United States to Scotland, I was born originally in Edinburgh, I moved back on the 2nd of August and I had a bit of time on my hands and I uh, thought, oh, this uh, festival, what is it? That's so unusual. I grew up with the Edinburgh Festival but not the Festival of Politics. And little did I know that at that time I would be ending, ending up convening the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee. So you never know what happens to your life when you come to the Festival of Politics. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.